Chapter 1. Suddenly she realized. One night in April 1977, in a Mormon church meeting in Sterling, Virginia, my mind finally burst the chains that shackled it to the known world and leapt spiraling upward and outward in quest of a new world, the journey for which I was born. The knowledge, deep and pervasive, locked in the genes and chromosomes of every living woman, that men have built all they have built out of the bones and blood and entrails of women, exploded into my consciousness that night, wounding me in a thousand places and smashing my bridges to the past. Yet even at that moment, when on one hand I was angry and wretchedly miserable, on the other I was ecstatic. Despite everything, women were rising. We were rising at last, mothers, sisters, daughters, at last, in every race, every class, every country of the world, rising everywhere to save our own lives, and in saving our lives to save the planet and all life on it. The classic feminist awakening, twin births of fury and ecstasy. I went out from that epiphany, utterly transformed. That this epiphany burst upon me during a Mormon church meeting is deliciously ironic. Perhaps nowhere except in Muslim society is the daily sacrifice of women's lives more evident than in Mormondom. It has the naive beauty of fate that a Mormon elder giving a puerile anti-ERA presentation inadvertently loosed me from my cage and catapulted me into the greatest spiritual revolution in history. Lightheaded with hope, shaking with rage, every cell shouting for joy, full of passion to be part of that vision, I focused like a laser beam on ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, because that was what I could see to do. I didn't look to the right or left, and I didn't lose heart, not even for a moment not even when I watched the ERA fail in state after state. I never doubted that we would ultimately succeed in the work it was our destiny to do. The vision of women creating a new heaven and a new earth eclipsed all other suns in my heavens, made all other goals, all other endeavors, insipid and banal. It stirred me in the deepest recesses, awakened longings for freedom so intense and poignant I would moan aloud and surprise other shoppers standing in line at the supermarket. I was giddy with relief at having seen it at last. Like coming home after being half-dead with loneliness, like finding again someone I had loved and lost and for whom I had been sick with longing. To bring the dream into reality was worth anything, everything. Nothing was too much to ask of me in its service. It enraptured me, and I lavished upon it a passion of which I hadn't dreamed myself capable. But passion is not allowed in the service of women. For millennia, men have taught us in terribly clear ways that our best and strongest and most courageous and deepest is for them. Women have not been permitted, without paying incredibly severe penalties, to give all our thought and energy, all our courage, all our willingness to try anything, to make mistakes and to try again, to work and to love unfailingly to the end. All the greatest of our great gifts, two or four, ourselves or other women, to do so is unthinkable, monstrous. It is unthinkable and monstrous in patriarchy for women to demonstrate that we care as much about justice and dignity, as much about freedom for ourselves and our sisters, to the laying down of our lives if necessary, as men and women have always cared about justice and freedom for men. It is the ultimate anti-patriarchal act. It is heresy. It is revolution. And so the stand-ins for God, the God-men of the Mormon Church, excommunicated me. In doing so, they unwittingly gave me a platform from which to expose the hatred of women fundamental to Mormonism, as to most religions. And even better, a platform from which to make women's oppression visible, the oldest, most widespread, most taboo, and therefore the most invisible of all oppressions. I traveled all over the country exposing patriarchy. By the time I began to speak for a living and to support my children this way, it was 1980. To use the word patriarchy in a formal speech had become declassé in the mainstream women's movement. Just saying it made, and still makes, many people bristle, and even some feminists squirm. Women's lives have depended on keeping an ancient and unspoken agreement not to name the foundation of present planetary violence. To do so is taboo. I broke the taboo. After that April night in the church, it was easy for me. Growing up Mormon gave me distinct advantage over those feminists who grew up in, quote, liberal churches. Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Unitarian, Quaker. Note, it is no accident that the women's movement has become home for so many lapsed Catholics and Jews. Catholicism and Judaism are also accredited universities for the study of rampaging male supremacy. For those who grew up in so-called liberal churches, patriarchy as a habit of mind, a system of values, a method of operating in the world, had been camouflaged, rendered murky and ambiguous, hard to pin down. It has been more hidden and padded and veiled and softened for public viewing in those churches than it had been for me. Mormonism is patriarchy at its most arrogant and blatant. I had studied it for 43 years in all its stark nakedness. When I became a feminist, I realized that I knew patriarchy inside out, thoroughly, intimately. I knew how it functioned from its bones through to its muscles and flesh out to its skin and clothing, its odor, its aura, its ambience. I could recognize it with my eyes and ears shut, could sense it immediately, knew the reaction of my skin to it, how it prickled in the roots of my hair. The Mormon elders had trained me to be one of the world's experts on patriarchal ontology, and I could never be deceived again. Neither could I be manipulated by fear not to name it, and name it, and name it again. The rule of the fathers, the worship of the male, the rule of men over women, patriarchy, the destroyer of joy and hope and life. Everywhere I went, I unveiled it to my audiences. Everybody born on planet Earth since about 2500 BC, I told them, 
has believed, whether they were religious or not, whether they were conscious of it or not, that God and men are in an old boys club together, with God as president. And because they are all guys, they have a special understanding. They speak the same language. They're in the locker rooms together a lot, in the boardrooms, and God only has to take one look at them to see that the men are superior in every way to the rest of us, because they look like him. So he loves them very much and trusts them. He intends them to be the presidents and prime ministers, the kings of the world. He wants them to be the popes and prophets and priests. He wants them to own all the property and businesses and make all the decisions and all the money and boss everybody else around, meaning women. And there we are, outside with our faces pressed up against the window trying to see what's going on. Pretty soon one of the men comes out of the clubhouse. Because we're hungry and lonely and scared, we run up to him and beg, please, oh please, tell us what God's saying in there. At first he looks surprised, but then a sly, calculating look comes over his face. He leans up against the pulpit and says in a deep, stirring voice, God told me to tell you that he wants you to be sweet and gentle and have a soft voice and never raise it. He wants you to understand that the purpose of your life is to make my life comfy and cozy, healthy and happy. And warming to his task, God told me to tell you that he wants you to send me off to work every morning feeling just terrific about myself, to be just a wave in your pom-poms for me all the time. Yeah, that's it. That's what God told me to tell you. Then in a stern voice he adds, and... God wants me to warn you that if you don't do this, I have his permission, in fact his command, to punish you, to kill you if necessary. So we have known for a very long time that in order to propitiate God, who is the president of the club, we have to placate his cronies, the men. And that in a thimble is patriarchy. Mary Daly puts it more elegantly and succinctly. As long as God is male, she says, the male is God. Which is why changing our view of God has everything to do with changing the world. My spiritual release from Mormonism took place shortly after my official physical release. As I looked about myself with new eyes, I lost all illusions about organized religion as a means to moral ends. I saw that all churches were the Mormon church, more or less spiritually squalid, since they were made by men for men at the enormous expense of women. As Marlene Mountain puts it, organized religion, you bet, organized against women. I saw clearly that religion was the central pillar of patriarchy, the means through which male supremacy became and remains dogma, by which maleness is deified, and by which all that is female is subverted to the purposes of men. Because its social and political and economic function is to justify and perpetuate the slavery of women, the religion of the churches is not only incompatible with genuine spirituality, religion and spirituality are downright contradictory. Religion as we know it is antithetical to justice, love, mercy, decency, kindness, to all that is good. But patriarchal religion, the center pillar of patriarchy, is dying. Fifty years from now, if we can keep our small planet spinning coolly in space, we won't recognize the churches. They won't be around in their present forms, except perhaps like the Amish as oddities here and there. They are dying because they do not have room in them for women's magnificent, awakening, expanding spirits. Men's mean, narrow, sunless churches can no longer hold us. The fire in our hearts is boundless. I gave religion up without a backward glance, and I gave it up forever. That doesn't mean that I cease to believe in a beneficent universe, a universe that wishes all life well. As far back as I can remember, I was always aware of a reality that could be neither seen nor heard, but only most overwhelmingly felt. When I gave up religion, I gave up the nonsense I was taught that this experience of transcendence was named God, that it was male, that it was other, outside me, independent of me, and much superior to me in every way, superior beyond description or imagination. I gave up the idea of worship altogether. It made me feel small and weak, and I knew by then that the true expression of my spirit made me feel invincible. While I was still in the church, however, a belief in Mother in Heaven provided a transition for me from Father God to God within, and I was learning that before there was God, there was the goddess. But I had no desire to look back to an ancient goddess religion. I rapidly rejected the notion of putting a skirt on God and calling him the goddess, and worshipping essentially the same sort of being, wrapped in dogma and hierarchical trappings. God in drag is still God. Yet I speak of the goddess often lovingly, and carry the image of her in my mind, an image that helps me counter the image of male deity, which still insinuates itself in a dozen ways into my psychic landscape. I know that goddess ritual, insofar as it generates reverence for and celebrates that which is female, which is us, is fiercely empowering, and that her image in our minds, images of ourselves as deity, is necessary as a blueprint for a more authoritative mode of being in the world. The goddess is a metaphor for our own and all women's creative, healing, transformative powers, a representation of our inner selves, something tangible, a concrete image that captures our full attention and draws us into the metaphoric process. Quote from Nell Morton, The Goddess as Metaphoric Image, 1985, page 155. But she must remain consciously metaphorical and only metaphorical, or we risk externalizing and losing our power again. We risk relinquishing responsibility for our lives again. Even with the goddess established security in our minds only as metaphor, we must be careful to avoid participation in any goddess rituals or events that stress our helplessness, our need to be rescued or to be dependent on strong spiritual leaders. 
rituals which encourage self-indulgent emotionalism or involve us in thoughtless theatrics. Genuine spirituality for women will always have its foundation in a radical feminist analysis. Feminism is spirituality, but it is not religion. It is about the rising of the spirit of half the human race. It is the foundation of the women's movement, which is the greatest spiritual revolution in world history, producing globally the most profoundly transformative human change ever wrought. I came to view that impetus for growth and for good in the universe with which I felt in greater harmony every passing day, not as outside me, but within me, not as separate from me, but part of me, as I was part of it. Not as infinitely wiser and better than I, but as my peer. Together, shoulder to shoulder, we were the creators of heaven and earth and all that lives in them. So, my abandoning all the senile, barbaric religious notions of God did not mean that I ceased to be a spiritual person. On the contrary, only when I finally wrested responsibility for my own metaphysical life, away from the elders, and assumed my rightful authority, did my spirit, which had strained against the spurious authority of the God-man all my life, begin to expand as if to fill all available space. Sprung by the patriarchs themselves from the dark, airless little box called patriarchy, my possibilities were suddenly as limitless as the sunshine and the wind. I recognized myself finally as a prophet, all women as prophets, and knew that at this time of the world only women are or can be prophets. One night, several months after my excommunication, I had an unusually vivid dream. I dreamed I was floating high above the earth, looking down upon it as the astronauts do, seeing it spinning below me all blue and white and radiant. I was in my nightgown and my feet were bare, but the air was warm and soft. I dipped and soared and turned somersaults and danced, sometimes in elegant slow motion, sometimes swift and breathtaking, all with a feeling of power and freedom and confidence, which in my waking life was quite alien to me. It was a wonderful dream and I smiled every time I thought of it the next day. Several nights later I dreamed this dream again, me spiraling upward in the same great arc of unhampered movement, out over the boundaries of time and space. The same warmth, the same sureness and certainty at the center, the same exhilaration of moving effortlessly with infinite grace and perfect control. And then, sometime during the next week, I dreamed it again. Sonia, I said to myself, when I wakened from it the third time, I think you're trying to tell me something. I think you're trying to tell me that I'm finally free and anything is possible. I remember how I whooped aloud as I sprang out of bed and jigged to the bathroom. This year ain't called the women's liberation movement for nothing, honey. Though years have passed, I haven't forgotten the promise of that dream. I still believe it. In fact, it won't be long now. I've been feeling it coming on. One of these days, soon, I'm going to fly. One day, shortly after I recognized all churches as the Mormon church in various guises, I was surveying the national and international scenes through my new wide-angled lens when suddenly everything clicked into place. Of course, I should have known. The whole world is the Mormon church. I realized that far from being politically naive as I thought, I was surprisingly and uncommonly savvy. Having perceived that global, social, political, and economic theory and practice are based on the same principles as the Mormon church, I understood immediately and viscerally the mind that rules every country. I knew the values, the assumptions, the needs, and the motives of those in power everywhere in the world. Having studied these habits of thinking and acting for so long and so thoroughly in the microcosm of the Mormon church, I found their extrapolation in the macrocosm a simple matter. I also knew a thing or two about fear at the end of my two and a half year confrontation with the church. I knew that the greatest fear of all accompanies the breaking of taboos, and that since the most powerful taboo in the world for women is the one against disobeying men, those of us who break this one must be prepared to battle intense and apparently irrational terror. We are not afraid because we are fools. We are afraid because the message, if you go against the men, you will surely die, is italicized and underlined in blood by the millions of hideous deaths that have been suffered at men's hands by women who have been perceived as uppity. At the beginning of my public struggle with the church, I spent a week nearly incapacitated by fear at the prospect of testifying as a Mormon woman before a Senate subcommittee for extension of time to ratify the ERA. But I did it, and I didn't die. I didn't even languish. Quite the contrary, I flourished. And with every fresh act of daring against the taboo, I blossomed more. Instead of hiding all scrunched up in my fearful skin, clinging to it, I began to slough it off and stand up straight, clear and clean, my strong new skin gleaming in the sunlight. It felt wonderful. Why hadn't I done it sooner? But as I looked around me, I saw that many feminists, perhaps because they had not had the great good fortune of being kicked out of the Mormon church or the equivalent after a rousing set too, were still scrunched up in their fearful skins. I wanted them to feel as free of fear as I did now. I wanted all of us ultimately to divest ourselves of fear completely. I knew that didn't mean we would run amok. Those who believe that one must have fear to have good judgment are wrong. Fear undermines good judgment. It prevents us from thinking clearly and from recognizing and exploring alternatives. Fear is the supereminent weapon of the patriarchy to keep women in our place. I also knew that, though I had never cared much what others thought of me and what I did, I would care even less in the future. And I realized that for the women's movement to succeed, many women had to be similarly free, not just from the terror of breaking taboos, but from the garden variety fear of social disapproval as well. I had no idea how other women could liberate themselves from it, or how the few who had succeeded had done it. 
I only knew that it was immensely important to figure out how it could be done on a large scale. I longed for a mass sloughing off of old, dry, nervous, cautious skin, in a mountaintop ritual, maybe, somewhere among the sun-baked rocks. So I put it in the back of my mind where I put problems that need work, and assumed that one day, as is my wont, I would suddenly discover that I had unconsciously accumulated evidence and done research and had some idea how to begin.